lovely to see everybody here. Very warm welcome to the Society of Antiquaries and delighted that such a broad range of people are here for this very exciting new initiative that the Society is supporting. And I'm delighted to see it happening. It's a um, really important step forward. So before we begin, I'd like to just tell you, those of you who are new to the Society, a little bit about what the Society of Antiquaries is. It was founded back in 1707 by a group of like-minded men who met in the pub, the Bear Tavern, to discuss antiquities and the history of Britain. They were really interested in the material remains of the past, which is why archaeologists have always been so well represented in the society. But it is a society that exists for all disciplines, not just archaeologists. So historians, um, art historians, book historians, architectural historians, it's a very broad, broad church. So it was founded in 1707 and receives the charter in 1751, which allows it to become permanent. It moves into proper accommodation in Somerset House in 1780, along with the Royal Society. And it stays there until 1874, when with other learned societies, it moved into its current premises here in Burlington House. So they're all arranged around the courtyard, the Geological Society, the Astronomical Society, the Linnaeans, the chemists. So it's this sort of hub of learning in the center of London. And it continues to um, operate as a society completely independent of any other um, higher, ed higher education institution or charity in order to promote the study of the past. It's interested in research, in conservation, in heritage, and it is a registered charity. We're committed to sharing our collections and our work with the public, which we do with public lectures, such as this one today, public tours, exhibitions, scholarly research seminars, and a program of publications. And last year, we launched our affiliate membership scheme. So you can now join us in understanding the past today, tomorrow, and in the future. So I'd just like to introduce um, Kate, who's giving the lecture today, Kate Hawkins, FSA, who works for Southeastern Archaeology Southeast, which is a part of UCL. And she's been involved in commercial archaeology for almost 30 years, having studied first at Winchester and then at Sheffield. After working in the field, she decided to move into post-excavation. And since then, she's been a very strong advocate for improving working conditions in archaeology particularly through her role in the Chartered Institute for Archaeology, where she's, as vice chair, she's been responsible for personnel and membership. She's been a board member for the Institute on the Qualitative Inequalities for the Archaeological Sector um, Research Project, and the outcomes of this will be published shortly. She's also co-authored the Respect Guide, Acting Against Harassment and Bullying in Archaeology, which led to a volunteer campaign, respect campaign in archaeology. And Kate's engaged in a lot of collaborative initiatives with colleagues in Europe through the European Association of Archaeology, who are also working against sexual harassment. And this exhibition is a product of that um, collaboration. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Kate, to introduce that video that we've had a quick foretaste of and really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Um, yeah, we wanted to start with um, an introduction from the French team who are responsible for the exhibition that you've seen today. Um, so we've got a short video from Archaeosexism, and then I will follow up with how we challenge sexism in archaeology in the UK. Hello, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, I'm Belin Basquini, and I'm very pleased to be here today to represent the collective and the association. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Kate Hawkins for everything she does uh, to promote the Archaeosexism exhibition in the UK. Uh, the project would never have had such an outreach without her, and this is a lot of work. So thank you so much, Kate. You are really amazing. <laughs> 
I will explain how this all started and why we thought this exhibition was necessary as Belgian and French archaeologists. Let's start with presenting the context. We are at the beginning of the 1970s. Feminism and gender studies have already spread in most fields in humanities and social sciences. Were they all men? The question is asked for the first time in 1979 in a conference organized by the Norwegian Archaeological Association. It does have a moderate impact in the field. The first publications integrating feminism as a way to analyze archaeological data and as a way to consider the field in general appear in the English-speaking and Scandinavian worlds in the 1980s. In France and in Belgium, these publications are at best ignored and in the worst cases, when they are read, they are laughed at and eventually discarded. In 1997, in a review of the book Equity Issues for Women in Archaeology, published in 1994, the French prehistorian Sophie de Beaune notes, One could explain this discrepancy as a consequence of the language barrier but I would rather interpret it as a lack of interest among European scholars for this type of debate. By Europeans, she means continental Europeans, of course. Let's say that the difference of treatment between men and women is undeniable. The topic would deserve better as is armchair sociology anyway, but European scholars do not think that dedicating multiple conferences and meetings to this topic would be of much interest. She points out what she calls American women's susceptibility, and she worries about, I quote, the climate of intellectual terrorism that tends, according to her, to prevail in the US, as well as the negative impact of this climate on younger generations. Some 20 years later, what do archaeologists think about those questions in France and Belgium? Well, pretty much the same. First, gender archaeology. The situation begins to improve only after 2010. From this period onwards, a few articles are published in French, by French scholars sorry, on the subject, and a few PhD students start to work on gender. But overall, the subject is not taken very seriously by many French and Belgian archaeologists and considered too political. Publications are still rare, and scholars working on the subject considered as non-conformist and a bit eccentric. The long neglect of gender studies among French-speaking archaeologists has also come along with a denial of discriminations experienced by female archaeologists in their working environment. Sexism, and more generally discriminations in archaeology, is a recent topic in the French-speaking world. This is where Peter Truel comes into play. This project, created by Belgian archaeologist and feminist activist Laura Marie, fights for more equality and diversity in the world of French-speaking archaeology. Laura Marie created Peter Truel in 2017 after she became aware of the fact that the heteropatriarchal and racist world within which we are living not only has an influence on our behaviors and our relationships with our peers in universities and archaeological units, but it also strongly influences the way we interpret and the remains of the past. Therefore, the fight we lead with Peter Truel has two components. First, promoting gender studies in archaeology. Second, make people more aware of bias and discriminations in archaeology, including sexist, racist, class, homophobic, biphobic, transphobic and ableist discriminations, in order to dismantle them. But where to start? The first obstacle we are facing is denial. When Laura started, the subject was almost completely invisible in Belgium and in France. Sparse articles, no books, no conferences, no Facebook pages, Twitter account or YouTube videos. The lack of quantitative and qualitative data would actually strengthen the belief of many people that there were no issues related to discriminations in French-speaking archaeology. At that time, Laura Marie got to realize how important online activism was. In the last 15 years, the web, especially social networks, has become one of the main sources of information. Hence, to be visible and active online is essential. So let's occupy the space and see whether the fire of revolt gets going. To overcome the lack of qualitative data, 
Luha created in 2017 a Tumblr to collect anonymous testimonies on discriminations in archaeology. Many other feminist actions used the sharing of testimonies to raise awareness on several issues since the 2010s. The Peytatruel project was di directly inspired by two of them, Peytatruel, a French project, and Everyday Sexism. As many people here probably know, Everyday Sexism was created in 2015 by British archaeologists Hannah Cobb and Catherine Pochet to gather testimonies of sexism in archaeology in the English-speaking world. According to philosopher Elsa Dolin, sharing experience is a process of political conscientization. It highlights the deeply political dimension of things that were, until then, considered as private. In the world of archaeology, discrimination issues were a taboo. People did not think, talk about it, and when they did, it was often with embarrassment, fear, behind the door or a pile of earth, and often minimizing the facts. For this reason, it was crucial to bring the crude reality to light and to encourage a sense of solidarity between discriminated people. Peter Truel soon gathered dozens and dozens of anonymous testimonies. At the same time, the movement spread information on feminist archaeology and feminism in general uh, uh, online, so on YouTube, uh, Instagram, websites, articles, podcasts, etc. These articles, videos and testimonies are published by Peter Ruel on social networks and they are widely liked, shared and commented. They create a new political space and consequently new solidarities are rising. People following Peita Truel now have the feeling of belonging to a group and to contribute to a wider social movement. The high has become a we. So beyond online activism, Peita Truel has been leading actions in various universities, museums and research institutions since 2019 in collaboration with the uh, Archaeoetic Association. In 2017, Ségolène Vandevel and I were both PhD students in archaeology at the Université Paris 1 Panthéon Sorbonne. We decided to found together an association to promote research on ethics in archaeology and ethical practices. In May 2018, we organized an international conference in Paris. With this meeting, we wanted to encourage reflection on ethics in archaeology in our country, France, where the subject was still widely ignored. The conference covered a wide spectrum of topics related to ethics, yet the problem of sexism and discrimination was not part of it. We thought it deserved its own event, and during the preparation of the conference in September 2017, we reached Laura, the founder of Peter Truel, which was very active online, to create a common project. That's how the Archaeosexism exhibition was born and first exposed in March 2019. Archaeosexism is a traveling exhibition of illustrated testimonies of sexist discriminations in archaeology. The concept was first to launch a call for anonymous testimonies in the French-speaking world, mentioning they would be used for an exhibition, then to have them illustrated by professional artists. So uh, it's important to understand that the artist and the person who wrote the testimonies are two different persons. And the project was funded by Université Paris en Panthéon Sorbonne, the French National Center for Scientific Research, and several public centers of research. It's completely non-profit and the entrance is always free. We had two main objectives. First, make people, make people aware, especially archaeologists, that yes, sexism in archaeology is a thing. And second, well, how can we improve the situation? Since May the 8th, 2019, the exhibition has been touring in France and in Belgium, in universities, research institutions and museums. It then reached Switzerland at the University of Lausanne and Quebec at the University of Montreal. It has also been adapted to an American audience through a partnership with Stanford University. For the American version of the exhibition, which is also the one which is now touring in the UK, we decided to keep some of the most striking and representative posters from the European exhibition, and we selected a few American testimonies that were also illustrated by artists, uh, Angela Han and Elaine Pei. 
Of course, no personal experience can reflect a phenomenon in its social, cultural, and systemic dimensions. Yet, in the case of the archaeosexism exhibition, the great number of testimonies about harassment, abuse, assault, and more generally, on sexism, sometimes mixed with other forms of discrimination, revealed that these are not just past anecdotes, but rather the tip of a bigger iceberg. The viewers can also see very clearly how some themes or behaviors are recurring again and again, revealing more systemic trends and mechanisms. Um, you will also see that uh, if some forms of sexism are typical to the world of archaeology, many could actually happen in other fields or in any social context. Therefore, the archaeosexism exhibition focuses on archaeology, but it illustrates more gener generally the process that are happening in the whole society. Beyond pointing out the problem, the exhibition shows that it's also possible to react, whether you're a victim, a witness, or a supervisor. After you are confronted with the experience of others through their testimonies, you might identify problems more easily when they pop up, and you might react more quickly and more efficiently. It is possible to act as an individual, either victim or witness, or as a supervisor, an institution, um, to prevent these situations to happen. So for a few advice, we recommend especially the last poster of the exhibition called Finding Ways to Find Discriminations. Um, I think you can see here the American version of it, but uh, Kate did an amazing work to adapt it to the UK. Among the various tools we can use to fight discriminations, we also recently developed a label called Chantier Ethique. It literally means ethical fieldwork in English. And um, so we are trying to promote it uh, mostly in French speaking excavations, but not only. Um, and to get the label, our digs have to meet several requirements. First, to you use the code of conduct uh, we prepared and have it signed by every member of the team. And second, accept, accept to follow the chantier ethic guidelines in the eventuality of a problem. So this is the code of conduct. Uh, this is the English version that you can find on our website. And this is a um, procedure, like you can see, like uh, many supervisors actually are not try, trained to react to this kind of uh, issues. So the guideline can help them to like have a simple path to follow when a, a problem arises. Since 2021, the label is officially supported by the French Ministry of Culture. The main goal of the label is to give students and volunteers a way to identify work Sorry, uh, to identify a work environment that tends to be safer, yet the label doesn't guarantee that the nothing wrong will happen, uh, but it guarantees though that the supervisors of the project are sensitive to these issues and that they are more likely to react in an appropriate way. Um, that's also why we also insist uh, a lot on the fact that the code of conduct should not be enforced on supervisors because its efficiency entirely relies on their goodwill. Uh, so yeah, again, you can download all these uh, materials on our websites. And uh, I'm proud to say that more than 20 excavations now have uh, received the label in Belgium, France, Italy, and Alaska. Uh, little by little, we also started to gather quantitative data in February 2021, we joined a project initiated by the Archaeology of Gender in Europe, the AGE, uh, and the European Archaeological Association, the EAA. And this is a project that aims at assessing harassment within archaeological communities through a survey in all European countries. And Peter Truel was in charge of spreading it in the French speaking world. So, I mean, uh, French speaking Europe, sorry. So that's Belgium, France, and Switzerland mainly. The survey was launched in February 2021, and the first results have been recently published in Antiquity, as you can see here. The encounter between feminism and archaeology is a pretty recent one, especially in France and in Belgium. Yet discriminations have a very concrete impact on the field. Many students and professionals face pay inequalities a gendered organization of the workforce, discriminatory remarks and attitudes, as well as the psychological and sexual harassment, abuse and assault. assault sorry. 
Yet we must keep fighting. A lot of work remains to be done either on the side of laws and regulations, which often exist but fail to be enforced, resources in workplaces and universities, almost absent in our countries, and disciplinary proceedings, which have to be reformed. While harassers and abusers are often well known by everyone, most victims do not dare to talk because of the lack of information, shaming, and the fear of consequences on their career. When they manage to get over these obstacles, the actions of their abusers are understated and only minimal penalties are inflicted, if any penalty actually takes place. The abuser is moved away for a while, his name is hidden to preserve his career, and the institution doesn't communicate officially on the case. The victim is often moved to another unit before the abuser comes back. As a student, she often leaves archaeology to find a safer, safer working environment. The institution tries to hush the martyr up. This is intolerable, and this should stop. And I don't know how many of you had a chance to look at the exhibition before you came into the room today, but um, I'm going to be around afterwards if you want to have a look. Um, and I'm also aware that for those people watching online, uh, it's not easy to access the exhibition at the moment. Um, I, please be assured that we are looking to get funding so that we can move the exhibition around the country to give everybody a chance to see it who wants to. Um, I also at this point want to thank UCL for providing the initial funding um, for us to have the posters, the English language posters printed. So I think this is currently the only English language version of the exhibition. Um, and also our Chartered Institute of Field Archaeologists who provided some funds for the um, remaining parts of the translations that needed doing. So Berlin has set the background. Um, I probably don't really need to put this sign up, but <laughs> definitions. Um, and when I was thinking about what to talk about today, there's, it's such a huge subject and there's so much, um, trying to narrow it down was, was quite difficult. So I wanted to actually amplify the work that's been done because there's a lot of work being done in recent years by various organizations trying to challenge sexism and sexist behaviors in archeology. span and provides some more of the background with particular reference to the UK. Um, obviously, since the Equality Act in 2010, discrimination on the grounds of sex is legal. However, that doesn't mean it doesn't still happen. Um, and obviously anyone can make sexist comments or behave in a sexist way, um, but primarily it is women who experience this on a day-to-day -day basis, if not several times a day. And I'm aware that we may have a bit of a mixed audience online, so I wanted to summarize very briefly, as Berlin has done for France, um, how feminist archaeology interacts with the work that's happening today. And I'm well aware that I speak from a position of privilege. I'm white, middle class, educated, cisgender woman. And I'm not afraid to challenge sexism now when I encounter it. But that's a confidence that's come with age. <laughs> when I first started out in archaeology, you know, I wouldn't have confronted the behaviors. I didn't confront the behaviors. Um, and that was through a mix of fear and, reg and resignation, because it was just, well, it is just so endemic, isn't it? We just internalize it. Um, so let's have a look. Okay. So since the 1960s, um, second wave feminism really, 1960s, archaeology has been attempting to rectify the male bias. All of those androcentric assumptions that permeate the narratives that are presented. Um, 1979 has already been mentioned by Berlin and the Norwegian conference. Um, there was also a paper by Sally Rosen Binford. Um, it's quite groundbreaking. And we can't really talk about um, sexism without really mentioning Sally Binford and her entry on Trailblazer's website, which just says, she fought rampant misogyny within the male-dominated world of American universities. She's criticized for her tight sweaters and makeup and refused to do the cooking on her first archaeological dig. Um, and we've already heard about gendered work and roles, and they are covered in the exhibition. But then things pick up a pace in their 80s, 1980s, various papers were published. And through the 1990s and 2000s, we see the growth of gender archaeology and an increased interest in multivocal uh, multi pasts, um, recognition of intersecting identities, archaeology increasingly taking inspiration from civil rights, women's and black power movements. 
in how to deconstruct the narratives that were projected that were you know, pretty relentlessly elite white male dominated, as we know. And then again, as Berlin has mentioned, increasingly the internet and social media have become tools for activism, um, sometimes for the fourth wave, but that's where a lot of the challenging of sexism in archeology span has been rooted in recent years. So, I'm gonna move on to this slide here. Um, my professional background, as has already been said, it's in commercial archeology. span I work for UCL but I still work in developer-led archaeology as part of the team at Archaeology Southeast. So in the talk today, I am going to be primarily focusing on sexism in commercial archaeology because that's where I am. Um, but this talk by Rachel Pope from 2021 is um, it's a much, much watched, watched video, really. It focuses a lot more on the history of feminism and women in archaeology and academia and academic institutions and research. One to look up. Okay, so 1990, big year for archaeology in the UK, introduction of planning policy guidance 16, uh, led to the establishment of the competitive tendering system that we, we work in today. Um, you know, currently archaeology in the UK employs a region of about 7,000 archaeologists and has an industry financial value of over 200 million. Um, but the same year, 1990, at the Institute of Field Archaeologists Conference, which is now our Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, subtle but significant change in the name there with the F, um, there was discussion on women in archaeology. And there have been many of these over the years. But this was the first to identify structural imbalances faced by women working in archaeology. Uh, a subsequent report by Elaine Morris in 1992 ultimately paved the way for what became the Profiling of Profession Surveys, which I'm sure will be familiar with many of you today. Um, and I know British women archaeologists have a lot more to say on the subject, on that particular subject. So I'm gonna leave it here. Suffice to say that, you know, there've been numerous subsequent sector-wide surveys and we have a lot of quantitative data um, on the whole, all of it collected by men. So, how has all of this, um, what have people been doing since then? Okay, just some of the groups. Um, British women archeologists, I've just mentioned them. They've been going since 2008. Um, and Tether, Rachel Pope, and they set it up British women archeologists because they were tired. And I think it's probably say, fair to say they're still tired of the lack of action in tackling sexism in archeology. span um, and they have been, and they continue to be a uh, constant voice highlighting issues. Trailblazers, you know, it's not just about the narratives, it's also about amplifying trailblazing women in archeology. span um, I've already mentioned Sally Binford's entry um, and Beyond Notability is another initiative that's recently started. Everyday Sexism, founded in 2012 by Laura Bates. Uh, that was set up to document vast array of everyday sexism experienced by women. And just, you know, Laura shows just how ingrained sexism is in daily life in the UK. Survivor testimonies, they've always been a key element in um, raising awareness around these behaviors. And within three years of everyday sexism being set up, they had over 100,000 testimonies, which I think are currently being analyzed by a team at Oxford University. You know, and there were various attempts made to discredit the value of anonymous stories, but I think the everyday sexism insight makes it very clear that you know when you have that sheer volume of stories, the common threads discredit any notion of fakery. And then, as has been mentioned, every dig success, sexism set up by Hannah Cobb Kath Poucher, and they refined that approach to document more explicitly the sexist behaviours within UK archaeology. And some of those testimonies you'll see outside in the exhibition. And there are various other organisations as well, um, Black Trail Collective you know, committed to supporting archaeology students from communities traditionally excluded by traditional structures of archaeology and study of archaeology, and the CIFA Equality and Diversity Group, which has um, now been reconstituted as a committee within the Chartered Institute for Archaeology to try and fully embed EDI within the Institute. And then we get to 2017, the year it all, it all happened, it all kicked off with Me Too. But, you know, as we've seen, online activism had been around for over a decade prior to Me Too, which itself was a grassroots movement founded in 2006 by Tarana Burke as a way of providing support networks and empowering 
black women who'd experienced sexual violence. Specific to archaeology, however, several initiatives were also launched that year. Um, for some, like the Respect campaign, the timing with Me Too is incidental. Um, very quickly, Respect Women in Archaeology and Heritage, uh, often referred to as the Badger Respect campaign through its association with the British Archaeological Jobs and Research site, founded by David Connolly. But in 2017, we published the Respect Guide, that's myself and Kat Reese. And um, that was the result of um, conversations between myself and Kat during the latter part of 2016. And it's very much a product of our frustration at the lack of progress in tackling sexual harassment. And some of the testimonies in the exhibition, you know, they could be from yesterday or they could be from 30 years ago or even longer. Um, I would challenge you to tell them apart. Others were more in direct response to Me Too. So in Sweden, and I'm not going to try and attempt to pronounce that, it translates as excavation in progress. And it gathered testimonies from archaeologists in Sweden, again, engaged in universities, contract archaeology sector, museums. And the testimonies there revealed that despite their existing laws and regulations, sexism remains pervasive in Swedish archaeology. Everything from sexual harassment and microaggressions through to open threats and assaults were common, though sounds quite familiar to here in the UK. And Peter Truell has already been mentioned with Laura Mary gathering testimonies in France and Belgium. And actually others have followed on um, from all of this work using the online forum. So we've got the Mentoring Women in Archaeology and Heritage Support Group. Um, and also, you know, we all work closely together. You've got the Enabled Archaeology Forum, Museum Detox, Seeing Red campaign. So online activism in the last couple of years has played a huge role in raising awareness and facilitating supportive environments. And it's about that sense of community and solidarity that I think for a long, long time has been missing and actually silenced women into speaking up because everybody felt so alone and so isolated. But, you know, there are dangers to online activism. You know, you do open yourself up to considerable backlash. Um, it's emotionally exhausting. You can become mo no more for your activism than for your professional work. Um, and also, it's, it can be dangerous for women in other parts of the world, you know, as far, you know, depending on what platform they're using and access to their past activity and other organizations. And, you know, that is particularly pertinent when we think about activists working to fight sexism and sexual harassment in countries outside of the West. Um, I found the networks personally very valuable. And this was um, a quote I was, well, this was sent to me just last week, actually. And I think it shows how um, online groups and just the, the way that people can connect so much, you know, so much more easily now actually has a has a big impact. Okay. So feminism is activating fem feminism in archaeology is advocating for inclusive practice. What does this look like? This is a quote from Karen Dempsey's article, which again is a brilliant resource. Um, people want to look it up, it's open access online. So equal gender representation, open access publications, open forms of discussion, presence of different voices. And yet all of this is so important in the workplace. So I just show, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of words on here, apologies. Um, Inclusive practice means advocating against straight, cis, white, and male as the default. It can include relatively simple mitigations around toilet facilities, consideration of menstruation, childbirth, menopause, provision of appropriate PPE. Um, I put this one in here because I think this is this has been flagged as um, something that's maybe not represented in the exhibition, um, and is something that we hear at respect. We have a lot of comments around. We receive a lot of comments around things to do with toilets um, and PPE. Obviously, there's a legal requirement to provide welfare on site, but you ask any woman working on site and she will have a host of stories for you around welfare provision. But the previous slides I was showing about online activism, um, one example where this has been challenged recently, the Seeing Red campaign by Amy Talbot um, has made a big difference in, um, well, she focused on menstruation and field work um, we now have in toilets, which shouldn't really sound that surprising, should it? But, you know, emergency packs, sanitary packs in toilets and things. And it was a really 
think seeing red is a really good example of how this online activism creates an environment where it provides that confidence and that support for people to tackle you know seemingly small um, things but make it make a really big difference okay so we've mentioned gender representation what I wanted to do here was use some of the posters um, and the testimonies and actually put some of the data that we have against them so we can see you know just how this manifests so we can see here the latest industry survey showed our ecological workforce, comp workforce comprises 47% women, 53% men. And that basic binary division was presented because the number of respondents in the survey who um, identified as other genders was small and the authors obviously were worried about the risks of identification or misidentification. But the most recent survey was the first one that actually did ask that question. Um, but that 47%, 53% is not as clear cut as it's presented. There are still quite considerable biases. We might be 40% of the UK archaeological workforce, which is a big improvement from Elaine Morris's report in 1992, where we were 35%. Um, but you know, it masks significant differences in where women work within commercial archaeology, where women generally populate the lower paid areas, such as archives, illustration, and finds work. And a previous survey actually by Landward, who conduct the profiling of profession surveys, um, clearly showed that actually male specialists are charged out significantly higher rates than female specialists. So there we have sexism and the gender pay gap. Um, and while men may hold the majority of senior management positions, it's, you know, that's not the case on site. And again, that's where you see sexism and ageism, ageism coming into play. There's you know, a lot of women on site. And that poster there, who's in charge, it has to be the male, um, resonates with a lot of women. The gender pay gap. So since 2017, companies with over 250 employees are required to submit data on their gender pay gaps. Um, in terms of commercial archaeology, there are a small number of companies that fall into that bracket. Um, some of the larger companies, it's not so clear to pull out the data for the archaeology specifically. It is one area where things seem to be improving. However, when you look at where women sit within the different pay bands, you know, 50% in the lower pay bands, you, the number of women as you go up through the profession um, just falls away. And Prospect the Trade Union, their archaeology branch, they've done a lot of work on this, which you can find on Twitter. So just mentioned women in management. This graph takes data from the latest profile in the profession, and you can see women, the top line is women, um, and from between the ages of 24, 20, 24, when they finish their degrees and enter the profession, by the time you get to 34, there's a huge drop off. Um, So many of the factors that can lead to that have been identified. You've got job insecurity, low pay, lack of flexible working patterns, um, away work and ridiculously long commutes. I think a survey by Prospect Archaeology Branch recently revealed some people being expected to travel 360 minutes for a home job, which is just insane. Um, unpaid commutes, you know, they impact everyone, but they disproportionately impact women. But you know, that's down to women, isn't it? And lifestyle choices, we choose to have babies. Well, women may choose to have children, but they don't choose. And actually, historically, they've had very little control over the structural setup of a society that you know, has <laughs> just actively forces women to choose you know, families or careers. And sexism is rife when it comes to maternity. Comments from both men and women about maternity leave being a nine month holiday. Why should I pay for you to have children? You know, totally missing the point, um, you know, to paraphrase Laura Bates, you know, most cases, pretty much all cases, men are actually involved in a process to continue the human race, yet women are the ones who are accused of having the inconvenient pregnancies. Mm, no, companies and businesses in general haven't sorted out um, their infrastructure. And I should have gone on a slide. There you go. <laughs> you know, they haven't sorted out um, 
their infrastructure to facilitate this continuation of the human race, which I think is, you know, needed. Um, and there's also bias in comments, you know, women are encouraged to work part-time, part-time work's not viewed as, as valid as full-time work. Um, women can't, you know, you can work part-time in post-ex, but it's virtually unheard of in the field, but it is possible. Um, I personally know of an employer who enabled a woman to do a three-day week on a site job for a project, but usually when you request it, you're told that it's too complicated, there'll be a lack of consistency, with the paperwork, well, you know, that's the system's fault, that's not the individual's fault. And it is actually possible. So Mark Alpine recently trialed flexible working on some of their sites. Now you can see here, um, they had, they tried two different versions. So on one site, um, people could work extra hours Monday to Thursday and finish Friday lunchtime. On a different site, they gave workers the option to have a flex day every three weeks. And they had a flex buddy system. So when somebody wasn't on site, there was always somebody that was um, sort of covering for them. And, you know, you can see some of the quotes there from the people working on site. It's spot on. It gives you the chance to do things with your family that you wouldn't normally have the time to. We've never been able to do anything like this before. And it feels like the company are trying to give you a bit back. So, you know, that's the thing. All, a lot of these changes, you know, they benefit everybody. Um, and maybe now some of the, you've got men making the comments like this, maybe it, people will start to listen. But, you know, the other thing that comes across from this as well is why as a sector we treat our field staff with such disregard when actually, you know, they're fundamental to the entire industry and, and what we do. If we return to this slide, the graph at the bottom so if it's practically impossible to combine working on site with a young family, one of the main reasons is that's one of the main reasons that women cite for giving up work in the field. Um, and the graph at the bottom there is taken from a survey by British women archaeologists. And Rachel circled that I have had to choose and how that's jumped up from 2008 to 2016. Sometimes women are told to get a specialism to counter some of this because it's easier to manage flexible working in an office environment, but that serves another purpose. You move women into a specialism that usually goes hand in hand with removing them from the decision-making process. Rarely do specialists, for example, get to line manage. And once you're pigeon pigeonholed in a specialist role, it's much harder to move into management. It's a bit convenient. But, you know, at least women in these roles get the chance to publish, huh? Um, but no, again, studies are repeatedly showing that although women in specialist technical roles are producing vast amounts of data and contributing to client reports, they're not publishing in peer review journals at the same rate as their male peers, they're not getting the coverage. And a number of journals in the UK have recently been looking at this and looking at the rates of submissions and publications by women to see if they can determine any bias. But it looks like it's, it's not bias on the part of the editorial boards. It's something within our system that means that women are working, but they're not contributing to publications. There we go. So <laughs> some of the, the classic sexism that we encounter. You know, there's, there's no reason for women in the workplace to be referred to as sweetheart, darling, little girl, hello pretty, or to be told that they dig well for a girl or for a little girl. Um, you know, and if, <laughs> if someone's gonna call women by these terms when they're, they're on site, you know, they tend, you know, if you call them out, then you get the defensive comments of, you know, you need to calm down or can't you take a compliment, but they're not compliments. They're not appropriate in the workplace. Banter, you know, is that a sign of professionalism? Mm, I would say not. It might not offend you, but there's a good chance it's making somebody else on site feel very uncomfortable. And it's not as original as some people might think, even if you look at these. 37% of women heard that women are too physically weak or emotionally unstable for the workplace. 40% of women regularly or frequently heard inappropriate comments. That's from an American survey. The next two are from the Prospect Archaeology Branch survey in 2018. 27% of women heard unwanted comments in appearance, 26% heard sexual comments. Um, and then 
you know, we work alongside the construction industry a lot. 41% of women in construction heard inappropriate comments from colleagues. Um, and the emotion one, I actually find really quite difficult because, you know, it takes strength to show emotions, but it's always been seen as a weakness, um, because, probably because it makes people feel uncomfortable. But, you know, emotions aid decision making. And a recent survey by the Hartford Business School uh, recorded women scoring higher than men in 17 out of the 19 criteria listed for being effective leaders. So why don't we have more women as leaders in archaeology? And it's only a short leap from these comments to the blatant sexual objectification. And here we go. These posters are outside as part of the exhibition. And these are really, these are really quite upsetting and just, well, <laughs> many of the comments, one of the things I find difficult is many of the comments as well around this issue come from student excavations or training or research excavations. And obviously sexual misconduct in universities, that's, that's a whole nother, nother talk. And many of the universities are, are tackling this now. But, you know, I think it's worth pointing out, if we think about the charter, I think that um, goes alongside with this exhibition. You know, we need more things like that. Many students go on to research projects run by other organizations. But if they're doing that to fulfill um, uh, a degree requirement, then surely their host university should be checking that they're going somewhere safe and where they won't be exposed to these behaviors. One of the reason, um, much of respect, we didn't go down the, the labeling route is because, you know, it needs that, something like that needs backing, it needs support, it needs to be recognized across the sector. Um, otherwise you run the risk of people just sticking a badge on and you don't have the finances to check that they're actually doing what they say they're doing. But that is something that I think we can look more into in this country. And obviously sexism isn't the same as sexual harassment, but the acceptance or dismissal of sexism, along with other isms, like racism, ableism, and so on, is just banter. You know, it creates that environment where more serious behaviors occur. And the danger, it's the danger of sexism and why it needs to be challenged. And if we look at the, there you go, the pyramid of sexual violence, you know, you can see very clearly how ignoring or normalizing behaviors lead to an escalation of behaviors. And, um, you know, we do have reports of sexual assault and rape in UK archaeology. You know, don't be thinking that that doesn't happen just because you might not have heard of it. And at a UK archaeology industry sector meeting, I think it was back in 2018, 2019, it was one organized by the um, CIFA e and group that I mentioned earlier. Sarah May made the point that this is a health, you know, health and safety issue, and it is, and it should be treated as such. And even when things are tough economically, like they are at the moment, it's not enough to, for employers to be turning around saying, well, you know, we're just busy trying to keep people in jobs. Yeah, you should be keeping people in jobs, but you also need to keep them safe. And this is a safety issue. If you have people who are feeling they're, they're being exposed to sexism or sexual harassment, and they're feeling scared or intimidated, they're not going to be reporting things that they need to be reporting. They're feeling silenced. And I think that actually the archaeosexism the exhibition shows the range of behaviors really well and just how much it permeates everything we do. Again, this is a, <laughs> a very wordy slide, but it makes the point. And I've highlighted, you know, the background noise of harassment and disrespect connects to the assertion of power that is violence and rape. And actually, you know, sexism is never benevolent. It's not harmless. Sexism is about power and violence. It's about contempt and control and entitlement. And that's why it needs to be challenged. But how do we challenge it when it's that endemic? This report is one that's recently come out looking at sexism in schools. Um, and we can challenge sexism when it occurs, you know, and that can be dangerous and it can be scary. It's not easy to rock the boat when you're at the start of your career and you're in a precarious employment position. Particularly when we work in a very small sector where, you know, there's a good chance everybody knows everybody. It may be, you know, 
some of the smaller organizations, it may be somebody doesn't feel safe going to their HR officer because the HR officer knows or went to university with the person that's that's causing the problems for them. But you know, we can be aware of our own behaviors. We can support individuals when we see and we witness things. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to put ourselves in danger. If you don't feel safe to call something out, speak to that person afterwards, make sure they're okay, signpost them to support. Ask them what they want to do, but let them know that they're not alone. Know your employer's code of conduct. You know, um, employers should have codes of conduct. <laughs> and employers, you know, support your staff, engage with bystander training. It's to employers' benefit as much as their employees um, that their staff know that they have support to tackle these behaviors. Ensure that staff at all levels undergo training. Change the emphasis of the codes and the policies away from sexist behaviors being an aberration to them being normal. Because I think one thing this exhibition shows is that they are the normal. We have plenty of data to show it. And I think that's where the um, exhibition, that, you know, we can use the exhibition to challenge sexism. So I took the exhibition to the Chartered Institute of Field Archaeologists Conference earlier this year. And I took it there because it needs to be seen by the people that need to see it. A lot of people who come to this talk and who may be watching online, you know, we know, we know this stuff, we know it's happening. So I took it to um, the conference and there was a steady flow of visitors on the first day. And then I noticed that women were, you know, they'd come on their own, then they'd come back with a friend. And then sometimes they'd come back with a male colleague, usually senior. And women could literally put names to the posters. Do you remember when so-and-so did such and such on this and that site? The men quite often looked oblivious, <laughs> but you know, the women would walk around the posters nodding, not just at one or two posters, but at several posters or more. And on the last day, thanks to a suggestion by a colleague, we invited people to take some post-it notes and just pop one on a poster if it was something that they'd experienced or something they'd encountered in their education or in their working life. And within two hours, there were lots of post-it notes. And this is only part of the exhibition. Um, and then by lunchtime, women had actually started writing their own experiences on the post-it notes and sticking them on the wall. Um, it was really, really powerful. Um, and I've been to many CIFA conferences over the last 30 years. And I think having this visual presentation of everyday sexism, you know, it changed the atmosphere. It was very empowering uh, to have these unspoken behaviors so openly presented and up for open discussion. And <laughs> I think as well, you know, some of the people at that conference, they're not the people that would go to an exhibition or come to this talk, but they're the ones with the power to make the change. And I think they really need to start engaging with it because we've got a bit of a generational clash coming on. You know, a lot of our managers, they're younger baby boomers, Gen X, um, but the Gen Z population coming in, I think this, they're predicted to be 25% of the working population by 2025. These are the people who've experienced, you know, they've seen the Me Too movement, they've gone through the pandemic. Uh, a recent survey in America showed that 33% of women who belong to Gen Z would actively call out sexism in the workplace. Now that's up from 10% millennials, 7% Gen X, and only 3% baby boomers. So there is a big drive to, towards this. And I think we're gonna see a lot more activism and campaigning in this area. And I think that's where this role of this exhibition lies. Oh, actually, here's some feedback from the CIFA conference. It's worrying that men that have made these comments to me are at CIFA and pretend they aren't part of the problem. We had lots of people talking about the exhibition. I think it was a powerful addition to the conference and a reminder of the reality faced by many. And then we have organizations like CIFA, and CIFA's not the only one, and CIFA are doing a lot of work. Like I said, they help to um, fund part of this exhibition. You know, but why are predators allowed to thrive in our profession and work the circuit? Where is the safeguarding for our staff? Why should I be the one to have to leave because I value my life more than my career? Hmm. Hmm. And this one, 
Men run archaeology, always have, and at the moment always will. They have created a toxic discipline that stifles talent, discussion, flair, and women. End of period. And this is going back to what I was saying just now about, you know, why we need to engage and why we need to be more active and we need to show that we are tackling these behaviours. So, what do I want to see happen with the exhibition and in challenging sexism? We're looking at funding at the moment so we can move the exhibition around more so more people can see it. But I feel it very much has to be used in a proactive way. I don't think, you know, it's not, it's, it's not an easy view. It's not an easy exhibition to look at. And if it doesn't cause a reaction in you when you read some of these testimonies, then I think you really need to go away and reflect on why that's the case. You know, anonymous sector-wide reporting. We heard from Belina earlier about the problems when you report sexism or harassment. Um, and at present, there's no way of knowing. You can report somebody, they can be dismissed, but you don't know where they've gone. Will you see them on your next site? What employer have they gone to? Um, what about the digger driver from that plant hire company that your organization have said they're not going to use them again? But, you know, precarious employment, people work around, move around on a circuit. You never know when you're going to bump into people. Um, and I feel really strongly about this one. It's something that the sector could do. Um, we're very fragmented. I'm... I have the benefit of working for UCL, I have this. We have a lot of Archaeology Southeast, we have we come under the umbrella of UCL, but a lot of our colleagues working in smaller units and even some of the larger ROs, you know, it's, it's a very different situation. Um, and I would like to see actually with the exhibition and the funding, I would really like to get the whole sector together again, like the C for Equalities group did um, back in, I think it was 2018. The July 6th meeting um, and actually find out what's been happening in that interim. What have these companies been doing? Some companies are doing some really good stuff around maternity pay and various things, but it's all happening very piecemeal. Actually, we can use this exhibition to get everybody together and actually, you know, come up with a coherent plan. Codes of conduct that actually work. We've already touched on those. Um, training, effective training. We've used this exhibition with the students at the Institute of Archaeology. Um, we want them to know right from the very start that these kind of behaviours are not acceptable. And that's being supported now with active bystander training, which is now, it's been optional for students at UCL for many years. It was, um, it was set up by the student union. But this year is the first year we've actually made, it's been compulsory for our students. And hopefully the combination of you know, an understanding of behaviours and support networks and the confidence that comes with the training will be a powerful combination. Um, representation, you know, we're not a very diverse profession. We know this. And if it's, I've been talking about challenging sexism in archaeology today, and I've mostly been talking about white women challenging sexism in archaeology. And if we feel that we don't have a voice, then it's infinitely worse for our colleagues, you know, women of colour, trans women, our gender fluid and non-binary colleagues, you know, we need, we need to look at better representation and we need to lose the competitive power structures. You know, they're archaic, they, they work for a small number of people in the profession, they don't work for everybody, we just need to lose them and address all of the structural inequalities and fight all of the sexist and discrimination behave, discriminatory behaviors that we have, because otherwise in 30 years time, there's gonna be somebody else standing here and they're gonna be looking at us and saying, what did you do? And on that note, I think I'm gonna end. <laughs> um, I think, oh, actually, no, no, no. I have some thank yous. I need to thank Kat Reese at Respect, obviously the Society of Antiquaries and all the people who have been fundamental in getting this exhibition here and in helping us to get the word out and move the exhibition around. Um, so thank you to all of them. And I think the plan now is to stop the live stream, but I think if you're on Zoom, you'll be able to ask questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, for that very thought-provoking and in some senses alarming um, 
presentation in terms of the structural barriers as well as the social attitudes that um, women in particular are facing. So we are going to open it up for questions for people here in the room and for people on Zoom, but the live stream on YouTube is going to end. Um, so I'll just check that things are sorted out technically at the back. <laughs> they are great. So we have a question at the front and we do need to have a mic raving microphone. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. I have to speak as a baby boomer, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm absolutely horrified. I think it seems to be getting worse than even the 1970s, which I well remember. Anyway, um, I was just wondering if you could comment on the public profile, say, of media archaeologists, that one. Uh, you can't win because if you're glamorous, like Alice Roberts and Bethany Hughes, Bethany Hughes even had a Facebook page set up to her bosom. I mean, she didn't set it up, but that's how bad it gets. And Mary Beard, who wouldn't wear lipstick for a long time, she got in the neck as well. So what yeah. to do? There, do? there does seem to be quite... Oh, I've got the wrong microphone. Am I right with this one? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, there does... I was talking to somebody at the conference and they were saying they're actually linked to what you were saying about the backlash, they're almost seeing things get worse in a return of, I think they called it the 1980s man, but you know, the man on site with his, not quite as bad as getting his copy of the sun out, but a lot of the comments, um, they still happen, but they seem to be um, done more discreetly, um, sort of out of earshot, but they're, they're still there. Um, and the, yeah, I totally get what you're saying. You, you almost feel like you can't win. The more prominent women become, the more backlash they get. But, you know, fair play to the women that do that because, you know, we do need to do it. And I, I think I've noticed as well with the online support, when things like that happen on Twitter and on Facebook, you see almost like this instant communication and the rallying of support. And there is particularly on places like Twitter that can be incredibly toxic there's like a rallying call goes out and women, women and men actually come to the defense of that individual. It, it, you know, it's still awful when it happens, but people now have a, they can quite vocally and publicly counter it, if that answers. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has got anything they want to add. <laughs> anybody else? Yeah. It seems that because some of the work is happening in the field, perhaps you could kind of, um, you have this really good code of conduct now that could be kind of um, enforced or furthered by having a buddy system in the field because things are a lot easier to keep, keep a hold of in an office or in a hedge, headquarters than in the field where predators will have free reign. So it seems like maybe this is a start, but it's not going further enough. You could have a buddy system in the field or just kind of, have an organizational structure. That's what was coming at me in the sense of women being isolated out in the middle of nowhere with people who might prey on them. Yeah. Almost for formalizing the, 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 the old system, because we all know on site who to avoid. And you know, we've always helped women to avoid them, but actually formalizing that into a more of a support structure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there was a wonderfully clear definition of sexism at the beginning um, and saying, which was great because it um, shows how women have historically and continue to be discriminated against because of our sex. Um, I noticed later on there was the introduction of the word gender, mm -hmm. um, which I think brings in a conflict. How will women continue to be supported as the ones who are being oppressed by their sex, by the maternity um, leave being not, not denied, but you know, practices incompatible with the things that women face? Well, I think um, you know, sexism, toxic masculinity, it hurts every, you know, it impacts on everybody. Um, and like I said at the end, I think if we're if we're um, finding it incredibly difficult, then it's even worse for our colleagues 
like our trans colleagues and other people. So, you know, we just need to tackle sexism as sexism and just, you know, it's just not acceptable. I don't know if that answers your question or if anybody else wants to join in. No, no, I don't mean, I just mean that, you know, that whole, yeah, it's all appalling. Um, and I think a lot of the initiatives that are coming out now, they are very inclusive and they're like Seeing Red, for example. You know, those packs, the menstruation packs go into um, all of the toilets that are used by anybody. And I think it just shows how the next generation are very aware of the need to be inclusive and the need to support everybody because we're all facing discriminations. Um, just sorry. do you think that um, the sexism like in the field itself affects how you might analyze some remains and affects how you see possibly gender within your like work that you produce itself? For example, I know of incorrect analyses and um, just the ignorance that women could even exist in certain contexts is yeah, I think. The paper that I um, showed earlier, the one by Rachel Pope, she goes into that in a lot of detail and she looks at some classic case studies and goes through some of the traditional interpretations and that centering of you know, male prominence on certain things and devaluing the feminine side. So I would definitely say, have a look at Rachel Pope's paper because she, she talks about that a lot. And she comes from that, I'm very field-based as well, whereas Rachel comes from much more of an academic background. So I think you find some good answers there. We've been going a little bit over. <laughs> well, we, yes, we are getting at 10 past two. So I know people have got other commitments to get to. So I think we can close it there. But thank you very much, Kate, for a really important and as well as really stimulating presentation. And if you haven't had a chance to look at the exhibition yet, please do go, well, it's a bit of it in here, obviously, but also in the entrance hall. Um, please do go and explore it. Thank you very much. <laughs>